Thank you very much. So, um, trying to cover this title in about 30 minutes, it really is going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour through there. Um, I can normally talk for days at the best of times, so um, I'll try and sort of keep on track, and James is going to uh, give me a heads up right along. Um, and I've come at this uh, kind of basing it on Rob's overall theme for the day, which was I think I'm an adult and needs to just get me out of here. So it's trying to sort of cover for, for kind of all people in the room, not just specifically PhD people. Quick declaration of interests, um, disclosure. Uh, I've been an AOPLS instructor for quite some time now. Uh, I'm also one of the cardiac, one of the core paediatric group. Um, so as I say, some of this. I'm not wanting to try and teach you to suck eggs because some of the stuff people in the room will already be quite comfortable with doing. Um, just a slide I found there that's just teaching you to suck eggs. Um, however, the prospect of meeting babies, children, particularly if they're not your own and they're unwell, can make people kind of a little bit scared. You know, it's like parenting for the first time. Um, so the objectives I was going to try and cover was some of the common causes of cardiac arrest in children. Touch a little bit on some of the uh, differences in paediatrics when we're looking at basic life support and um, advanced life support. Cover a few useful formulae um, that uh, is commonly used uh, amongst paediatrics and APLS. Um, give uh, some um, recognition to James and Hannah's work over the years, the Paediatric Anesthesia Handbook, which is a fantastic resource. Both uh, physical hard copies are in various paediatric areas as well as it being available on the intranet and the NUH guidelines. Touch a little bit on some of the equipment that might differ slightly within paediatrics, uh, including some vascular access, and then just go through a few algorithms um, at the end. Um, as I say, it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, um, so I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but that's what I'm going to try and achieve in the next uh, few slides. So this one um, has been uh, kindly borrowed and reproduced by ALSG from APLS. Um, some of the airway obstruction bits, Sonia already um, touched on earlier in her airway lecture. And essentially in kids, we want to try and get these on the left hand side of the slide. So, you know, when things first start to go wrong, we want to try and intervene to either halt or at least slow the progression of whatever is going on. If we end up on the right-hand side of the slide where we've actually already got either respiratory or circulatory failure and or even worse, cardiac arrest, the outcomes are really not going to be good. So trying to pick things up on the left-hand side and treat as, as you're shining them. It's the same with adults, but some of the conditions may be just a little bit more sort of specific um, with, with, with um, paediatrics. People often get a bit worried about, oh God, what's the normal heart rate for a 1.2 years child? So we've got these great PUSE charts. So they're used paper-based versions as well as on the um, iPod touches and things. And there are various age specific categories. Okay, so you don't need to be, you know, if you're called to run and see a child and things are not very well, you know, oh what is the normal range and you know, are they out of it? because we've got these lovely colour-coded things that are sort of age-specific. So um, we are, as a trust, I think, changing over. I don't think we've quite changed. It's sometime in June, isn't it? We're going to the News 2, which is the adult early warning scoring systems. The Pew's charts aren't changing. They're staying the same. So we've had these for a while, and they're great for that kind of colour-coding. You know, green, not too bad. Yellow getting worse and red. So, you know, you'd be able to get a lot of information from that as to... Um, how abnormal the parameters are for the particular patient. Basic life support, again, Sonia touched on that a little bit with the infant, that um, when they're less than one years old, the occiput is much, much bigger in proportion to um, the child than it is as they get older. So when we're doing our opening airway manoeuvres, when we're first assessing a child, if they're an infant, we're going for just a neutral position because the tendency is with a big occiput, you would overextend the neck. Uh, once they're above about a year and two, then it's more the sniffing the morning air, provided there's no contraindication, we're worried about trauma. One of the key differences in pediatric basic life support, though, is giving five rescue breaths. 
going back to that slide that I showed earlier on where we had respiratory failure and circulatory failure both leading into cardiac arrest usually it's more kind of respiratory side things or other things with a circulatory rather than say a primary cardiac event like an arrhythmia so rescue breaths and you don't keep going until you've got five good rescue breaths in it's five rescue breaths at the beginning oropharyngeal airway depending on which life support course you've been on there's sort of a multitude of different ways of measuring the APLS way of measuring it is flange in the middle and then curved round. As you know, with adults, we have a range of OPAs available. You want to try and use the one that's kind of closest to the patient you've got in front. And we've got some very small ones that go right down. But as with adults, if it's too small for the particular patient, it's not going to work. It's not going to get past the tongue and the obstruction. If it's too big, there's the potential to cause trauma and damage inside. Um, so you know, trying to use the best of what you've got available there. Another key difference is when it comes to the compression and the breath ratio. So in adults, it's 13 to 2, chest compression to breath. In paediatric, it's 15 to 2. Um, the next two bits, actually, you know, in adults, I think they talk about 5 to 6 centimetres depth of compression. In paediatrics, they've just tried to say approximately a third of the chest. So don't you know, be getting down at the side and trying to work out whether you're just marginally over a third. or it, it, It's a guide. Compression rate, again, it's the same as in adults, 100 to 120 per minute. Um, obviously, when you're giving some breath, there's going to be a slight interruption with that, but that's the rate you're going at. The bottom bit, um, you may want to consider the encircling technique. I couldn't find a baby to borrow, um, so I've done a very small goal here. I'm not going to give it mouth to mouth. <laughs> but when you've got a single um, rescuer there, um, what can be very useful is if you're at the side of the patient, you can do two finger chest compressions and then giving your breaths. Once a second person comes along, actually you might find it easier for that person to do the encircling technique because it gets them ergonomically further away and then someone else can just concentrate on the head end. Again, whether as the child gets older, whether it's one hand or two hands, that's going to depend a little bit on the size of your own hands and the patient. But small babies, two finger technique or the encircling one is quite useful and you're using your fingers at the back to support. Thank you. Um, very similar once we get down to the bottom end and we're actually assessing the rhythm here. So again, we've talked about five rescue breaths, that's one of the differences. 15 to two chest compressions to ventilations. The other thing is in paediatrics, you do, if, if you were out and about and you found a child, you'd do a minute's worth of that before you went and called for help. Whereas an adult, because it's likely to be a more primary cardiac cause, you want to get the AED, get on, check for the rhythm. You'd, you'd leave your adult patient, you'd run call help. Here, shout for help, but do a minute's worth of BLS before then, if no one's arrived. If it's a small enough child and you can pick them up, take them with you. If not, you have to leave them and go and phone. But otherwise, once we're getting onto the ALS bit, it's very similar to adults in the sense of shockable rhythm, VF, pulse and VT, or non-shockable rhythm, asystole, PDA. So this is just broken it down into um, a little easier to see. Again, like in the adults, going through potentially reversible causes, 4Hs, 4Ts. So I'm not going to spell over that because that's the same from the adults. The drug doses, though, we do scale things down. So the adrenaline dose for an arrested child is 10 micrograms per kilogram given intravenously or intraosseously. Um, I've got another slide. I'll talk about that in a, in a bit. But it's yeah, 10 mics per kilo or 0.1 mil per kilo of our adult 1 in 10,000 adrenaline syringe. And again, you would be doing checking every two minutes and alternate cycles, you'd be giving your adrenaline. Um, whilst that's going on, this is the PEA algorithm, so there's no shocking going on. It, you know, if you've not got your vascular access, you're getting that. If you're able to, you get on and secure the airway and carry on. On the shockable side, the VF pulses VT algorithm. Um, again, it's three shocks given uh, every two minutes. Um, but it's four joules per kilogram. Um, the defibs that we've got, the life packs that we're still in the trust around, I don't think we've changed over to the new ones that we've um, looked at. Um, they don't go every single increment when you turn up the dial. So the teaching is it's four joules per kilogram, but you round up to the nearest next setting that's on the, um, on the machine. 
So as, again, as you're going around here, good basic life support going on, 15 to 2, giving you shocks. As you're getting ready for your third shock, you want someone to have the adrenaline ready. And then um, you'd also consider giving amiodarone after that third shock, and that's five milligrams per kilogram. And again, that can go intraosseously or intravascularly. If you've got a cannula in, it doesn't matter. And again, you know, in that time, you'd be trying to think of potential reversible causes as to how you got to that bit. So it's good old British June weather and Wimbledon's coming up. So this was just a little reminder about a mnemonic that um, it seems to be forever linked with uh, APLS. Um, APLS has never, ever actually um, endorsed this mnemonic, but it's been taught for donkey's years. Previously, it had a silent L. Um, they very much distanced themselves from that when the Antipodeans um, complained. But you will find, if you go to the paediatric recess bay here, uh, and most paediatric cardiac arrest, people still like to use wet flag as a, new, as a nice mnemonic to get some idea of weight and various other things. So some people just have the standard six things on the left, some split up the fluids and add in lorazepam as well. So I'm going to go through those three things, those uh, in turn. So weight, um, in the past, the... Um, guidance formula for what weight might be was based just on an age of a child and they basically said age plus four and then you doubled the figure and that gave you a number in kilograms and obviously that's just going to give you a linear um, relationship there and we know that looking at growth charts that actually there are different kind of spurts growth spurts so now um, APLS they've tried to sort of move away a bit from just the formula themselves and they will say, use growth charts, a uh, typical sort of 50th centile for ages and things, where you are. Um, if you are using a formula, they've now got three different formula. It hasn't quite projected that well because there's a jump up between the second and the third one. But what they've tried to do is by having these three formulae is match a little bit more closely. The one ringed in red is just another way of writing age plus four and doubled. So they've written it that way so that now you've got some way of estimating um, your weight just purely based on um, the child's age. So often if we get a red telephone call for ED and you've got some information you think, you know, you said, you know, two-year-old coming in, you'll find people will start to write out weight and then based on the weight get some of their calculations and things already done in advance, so you're not trying to do that um, at the time. Probably a better correlator is actually the length or height of the child. So there used to be what was called the Browslow tape, and you could measure the child when they did arrive in your ED against that, and that would give you probably a better idea of an estimate of weight and various things. More recently, there's been another one, Sandell, after Union Sandell from uh, down south. Um, but they're, they're quite useful and relatively easy to, to remember and think of if you need to get things. Energy, I said it's four joules per kilogram, rounded up to the nearest setting on your defibrillator. This is obviously if you're in the arrested situation. If you've got a child that still has some sort of output, but it's got an SVT or maybe it's a, a VT, they have got a pulse, but they're in shock, then actually it's uh, initially one joule per kilogram and then two joules per kilogram. So that's the cardiac arrest energy bit there. Tracheal tube, there are um, various formulae. Um, Sonia touched on some tube sizes sort of at the very little end uh, age range of the paediatric population and APLS always advises to have at least more than one tube available, you know, preferably half a size bigger, half a size smaller. The top formula, formula the uncuffed tube, mm. you used to take the age in years, divided by four and then depending on um, which text you read, you then added on four or four and a half and that gave you a starting point for your internal diameter in millimetres. As Sonia um, nicely presented earlier, the Marcus Weiss Zurich Swiss Group done a lot of work with their micro cuff tubes, and um, certainly in NUH now we've got them uh, across the whole range when we can get them from manufacturers, um, and basically they're half a size smaller. Rough uh, ideas of how long you need to put the tube in. So we don't tend to cut the tubes anymore now, be they cuffed or uncuffed <coughs> tubes. So you do have potentially quite a long tube. 
And the tendency can be, in the excitement of the situation, is to potentially feed a little bit more in than is necessary and then think, oh, why is the chest only moving on one side? So I think having that formula to mind is a really useful thing to just remind yourself that you may just need to pull back a little bit. So that's the rough idea of what length you'd need for an infant tube in a child. Aging years divided by two and add on 12 centimetres. We don't tend to nasally intubate them um, as our first line. That tends to be more something they'll change to upon the ICU. But they take into account the fact that you'll need a little bit extra length. Bottom bit, hopefully you won't be getting involved in having to tube neonates in an emergency. Um, but one of the things, quite a nice little uh, way of remembering things for us, this is for tube length now, one, two, three, is seven, eight, nine. So if you've got a one kilogram baby, it's likely to be about seven centimetres, the tube length. Two kilos, eight centimetres, three kilos, nine centimetres. Again, it's not a totally exact science, but it's a starting point. And in paediatrics and neonates, you know, once the tube is in and it's stable, very much getting the x-ray to look at where your tube tip is in relation to the carina, because it's a much shorter distance you've got to play with. But they're sort of useful starting points. Um, fluid boluses. So severely ill child, you'd be giving 20 mils per kilogram of 0.9% sodium chloride. Severely injured child, thinking's the same as in adults actually, that you know the first clot is the best, so you want to get enough to keep a circulation going without blowing the clot off. So you tend to just give it in 10 mils per kilo, reassess and you know give further ones and then start thinking of giving blood early. Lorazepam, so this will be when you've got a fitting child who's just not stopping fitting or it's been going on for a long time. 0.1 milligram per kilo, intravenous or intraorally. Adrenaline, we've already touched on that earlier when we was showing the advanced life support algorithms. It's 10 micrograms per kilogram, which equates to when we're using our one in 10,000, so our mini jets that are on the cardiac arrest trolleys, 10 mils contains one milligram. So we're giving 0.1 mil of that per kilogram. So if you had a 10 kilogram child, you just give one mil of it and that will give them the dose that they need. Glucose, um, in the past, people used to be giving much um, bigger amounts of dextrose. And yes, it corrected the hypoglycemia, but actually you tended to get a massive overshoot and then it got back down again. So the, the current thinking is, and I think for NUH, um, our treatment is if it's less than three millimoles per litre, we term hypoglycemia in a child, um, we would give two mils per kilogram of a 10% dextrose, give that as a bolus, but then remember to actually follow on with some dextrose containing solution, because you may temporarily um, halt or uh, stop whatever's going on there, you know, this may be secondary to sepsis or something, but actually if you don't continue, it'll drop back down again. Um, so I wanted to just remind people, I think hopefully everyone is already aware of um, the work that James and Hannah have done over the years um, with these paediatric anaesthetic emergency data sheets. So I'm not taking any um, uh, any sort of, um, word, but yeah, it's J James and Hannah's work. I'm not taking any credit, credit for it. Um, but just wanted to flag up that, and obviously there's other contributors that have helped over the years. Um, these resources, they have been, the latest iteration, I think, was updated in August of last year. So in any paediatric um, theatre anaesthetic area, there should be actually a physical copy of these, A4 um, ring bound there. Absolute wealth of information and data in there. If you can't find one of those in the anaesthetic room, as I said earlier, you can get to it via the internet fairly easily if you just go onto the guidelines and then follow the link to paediatric anesthesia, paediatric anesthesia handbook and it's all there in PDF format um, and there's a huge amount of um, information there so I know I've gone through some formulae to try and remember but all the stuff's in here. Um, I've not copied every single page of that but I've just given an example of a couple of the um, age groups so on the left hand side you've got three months old, on the right hand side a four year old so it's going to tell you what weight you're going to expect, what the normal values are going to be for some of the parameters. You're going to need to intubate a cuff and uncuff tube. You're needing to give um, adrenaline, amiodarone, dextrose. It's all there. The work's all been done for you. So fantastic resource. 
The other thing um, that um, many people have already got, um, I don't know whether dongle's the right word. A dongle normally, I think, means something you actually plug into a USB bit. I couldn't think of... Have you got any other term for it, James? Uh, no. No, so, so I'll put dongle <laughs> I'll, in... I'll let you name it. Uh, well, I've put dongle in inverted commas. So it's one of these kind of things. And it's reminded me that um, I think the last time I was asked to speak on paediatrics at one of the Divi days was many years ago when we were in the lecture theatre of medical school and we had a power failure just as I was about to start. So I ended up having to give the whole talk without PowerPoint slides. And I do remember getting one of these out and showing that at the time. We eventually got it back. But these... Um, Pediatric anaesthetic drug dosing guides. Again, it's like a little mini summary of some of the stuff that's in the PEDS cards handbook. And it comes out and goes back in. It's wonderful. <laughs> so there's a couple of slides here just of um, what they are. Those are my youngest son's thumbs. So he's probably going to get something for that later. Just holding out. So again, it's got some key information bits on one side and drug dosing on the other side. So Fantastic, and you don't need electricity to work. You just need to have enough ambient light. Um, James, did you say you might have a few? If yeah, I've still got some. Yeah, There's so a, uh, medical emergency version as well. Yeah, so if I could direct you to Dr. Armstrong afterwards, if you want to get one of these dongles. Um, thought I touched briefly on some superglottic airways. So um, on the paediatric cardiac arrest trolleys, there will be airway. There will be vascular access kit. Um, having had a quick look the last couple of days, I don't think we've actually got LMAs or eye gels on the PEDS arrest trolleys. However, there is a grab bag that the ODPs can take from main theatres on the Queen's site. And I know there's a grab bag at City, and I'm hoping that that is replicated the same as what's on this campus. But the paediatric grab bag that comes from either PICU or from main theatres has a complete range of LMAs in there. So if you're needing a superglottic airway device, you've got the ranges there. Um, eye gels are available. Any paediatric anaesthetic room that's got an airway trolley in it, the eye gels are on that. And as you can see from the sizes, they go down to pretty much tiny, tiny. Interestingly, looking at the LMAs, um, touching on what, again, Sonia said earlier, we know the anatomy tends to be the larynx a bit more anterior and superior. If you've ever actually looked at a size one through to adult, the angle that the LMA mask bit is and the stem comes in, it's exactly the same. It doesn't change. So I'm always a little bit more dubious of using the very small size 1.5, 1 LMAs, thinking it may not just fit as well. So just to keep that in mind, it may be what is your lifesaver, but just keep it in mind that it may not be sitting quite as snugly as a slightly older child. Um, the eye gels tend to just sit and mould a bit easier. So as I say, they are, they are available, so if you're in a rest situation and someone hasn't got a grab bag, get, get an ODP to bring the grab bag. And the other thing to say, I think, I'm not sure if Craig's come back here now, he thought I was going to be dissing PICU, but if there's a paediatric arrest, you will almost certainly get people from PICU as well arriving, so you shouldn't be on your own, so you should have paediatricians, PICU doctors, nurses as well, as well as the bags, bless you. Um, picture of a couple of endotracheal tubes, so the one on the left-hand side is the Portex blue line, that's the uncuffed tube, which we still will use um, in some of the very small neonates, because we've got a two and a half three and a three and a half. They do need a stilette for that. The smallest size microcuff tube, and on the right here, this is a micro, microcuff tube. This is the one that Marcus Weissertal did all their work on, um, making sure that it's kind of a, a low pressure cuff. It's quite distal. It goes down to a size three, which is essentially from about a three kilo baby upwards. Um, not all paediatric cuff tubes are the same. And we've had some issues with manufacturing where we've had to try and source an alternative. So I think at the moment we're on Parker Thin Cuff, but there's a multitude of other different cuff tubes out there. So don't necessarily think they function and work the same. It's, it's the, the, the actual micro cuff is, is part of the trade name, but I think a lot of people just use the term micro cuff as a paediatric cuff tube, which is not true. It was initially manufactured by Kimberly Clark, and I think it's Halyard now. Um, Laryngoscope blades, again, um, trying not to overlap too much with what Sonia had uh, said, but the top picture is of a Macintosh blade, size 2. The bottom one is a Cardiff Pro blade, uh, seen from two different uh, profiles. And 
this was this sort of originated from the Cardiff group. We basically wanted to try and get the benefits of a straight blade whilst also um, making it a bit easier if people aren't that familiar, that experienced, or only occasional users. So here you've got a Miller blade at the top and the Cardiff Pro at the bottom. So you can see with the Miller blade, it's got the straight blade, um, so you know, it can be helpful for lifting up that bigger floppy epiglottis. But with that curved shape, you've not got an awful lot of room kind of in the mouth and things there. Whereas the Cardiff blade, they've gone for that Z profile to make things uh, a bit more roomy. Um, and also, what they've done is by keeping the first proximal six centimetres straight and then just a little bit of an angulation at the top there, the idea is that you should always be able to see what you're wanting in sight without it being lost around the curve of the blade. So um, for people that aren't doing this regularly, probably the Cardiff Pro Blade is a good in-between kind of blade to go for. One of the key things to remember though is whatever you're using to intubate, you need to have something that's long enough to get to where you want to do. Okay, I've got five minutes left. Okay, I'm gonna speed up a little bit then. Um, you don't need to use all of the blades. You just, as long as you can get the tip into where you want. Um, so this picture, the top one is showing the Cardiff blade and because of the nature of that little curve at the end of it, the idea is that it's probably going to be sitting in the molecular. So even though you're using a straight blade, with that angulation and lifting up, you're more likely to get a, a view of it. So it's sort of hybrid between straight and curved. Um, Intraosseous needles. Um, we've had these in the trust for some time now. Um, there's three different sizes, and really you need to sort of be gauged on the um, weight size of your patient. The pink ones are only 15 millimetres long, so even if you've got a small baby, if it's quite chubby, you may find that that's not actually long enough. You may need the blue one. Um, just remembering that if you put an IO needle into uh, a child or they've got one in, it's not MRI compatible. Hopefully, um, people wouldn't be pressing for an MRI straight away after you've successfully stabilised the child. Um, we use these um, short-handled current drivers, and what can be very useful it's common sites for using them in children, is proximal tibia, so feeling the anterior um, tibial tuberosity just coming down and inside. People have sort of said big toe IO, so you're getting inside. And again, that can be really useful because when you've got a small child and stuff going on, if people are doing stuff at the airway, you can get access to the, the legs, so it's easy to work around a smaller person. Whereas if you're trying to go in at humerus and they're all doing stuff out there, obviously if they've got broken legs, trauma, the legs are not an option, but that's not that common in children. Briefly, touching on trauma, same principles, so it's catastrophic hemorrhage, ABC. Um, there is just some of the dosaging, so again, things have been scaled down. Um, so if you're giving tranexamic acid, it's 50 milligrams per kilo, followed by an infusion. Blood products, um, in massive hemorrhage, some guidance there. Transfusion targets are probably not dissimilar to what we're aiming for in adults. Um, trauma and C-spine injuries, not that common getting a C-spine injury, but the smaller the child is, um, the more that the C1 to C3 vertebrae are more vulnerable, because you've got a kind of bigger head moving around pivot points. You can also get this in skiwara, so spinal cord injury without radiological abnormality. Um, in the past, it used to be the holy trinity of a uh, C-spine collar, blocks and tape. And of course, you've got a very frightened, injured, upset child. That's just going to create a really good pivot point for them to completely break their neck. So it's very much now on the whole Mills manual inline stabilisation and trying to talk to them, remembering, get parents in there, use them to help. Um, hypothermia, it's the same actually as in adults. That's a scrap from Ice Age, if anyone's wondering who's got cold there. So again, if it's below 30 degrees centigrade, then it's a maximum of three shocks until you're above that temperature and no inotropes. Then when you're between 30 and 35 degrees, you can start shocking again and you double the time interval. So instead of it being four minutes every other cycle, it's every fourth cycle, i.e. eight minutes. And again, you need to be warm to be able to call it. Convulsing child, um, we do tend to get these uh, quite commonly from fever. So the febrile convulsions can be really pretty scary. Um, obviously, there's other things that can be causing it as well, so not to forget infection or hypoxia. Um, thankfully, uh, mortality with convulsing children tends to be lower than adults. Um, it's a busy slide, but it's now getting me on to sort of the last part. So we touched on lorazepam earlier as one of the drugs for um, a uh, convulsing child. Before that, you'd be giving buccal midazolam if you've not got your vascular access. 
Okay. This is one of the pages from those PEDS cards, the PEDS handbook. It's quite busy, so I'm not going to go through all of it, but it's just to let you know that it is there. And your key first drug that you're going to be giving intravascularly is the lorazepam, 0.1 milligram per kilogram. There's a, a whole host of algorithms in there for anaesthetic and medical emergencies. So septic shock, what's really quite useful there, again, you shouldn't be on your own. There should be hoping pediatricians for the ICU there as well. But that bottom bit, Partly down on the left hand side, their ID antibiotic therapy. Depending on the age of the baby and the child, they're more prone to different um, uh, infections. So that's why the microbiology is sort of targeting um, the most likely organisms um, by age there. Asthma can be pretty scary. Um, so back to back NEBS, it's just got the doses there, some of the IV infusions. Again, you shouldn't be on your own with that. Uh, I'm getting the T signal for time now, so down to about the last ten sli uh, few slides. Um, I think um, emergency front of neck access kind of was brought up earlier. I think there was a question from the back there. So in the past, it's always caused a lot. Well, it causes a lot of consternation. I think anyway in any patient, and even more so when it's a small child. And the whole needle cricothyroid bit is very hard to find. So we've refined um, our bit. So this is in the latest iteration. Was this the first time it's appeared? So I just need to check, but I'm not sure whether this has made it onto the intranet NUH guidelines yet. I think that may be the 2006 one. So the printed out copies that are in the various areas have now got this in. And essentially we have tried to um, keep things simple and follow what we're doing for adult practice. So that top bit, scalpel, size 10 blade, Basically, if they're eight, older than eight years, use a size five tube, cuff tube. If they're less than eight years, use a size three tube. And again, this middle bit here is really, I think, quite helpful. Because if you can't feel the cricothyroid membrane, it's not palpable, then basically you're making a big, long incision below the thyroid cartilage and just trying to get in there with fingers. Okay, someone asked me earlier, you know, what do you do? And I said, well, pray. Um, but also, probably, um, it's a last ditch attempt, you know, if you're in this situation. So trying to not trying to intervene before you've got to this bit again getting ENT and various other people around um, yeah so block tracheostomy as well so it's a stepwise thing of doing that um, I'm not sure whether we've with our ENT colleagues quite got to the point yet where we've got the things above the heads of the beds for the tracheostomies they're around they're um, around I, I see you and HTU they are good I okay. don't know about the yeah so it was a national tracheostomy project where they were trying to anyone with a new tracheostomy put in having a nice poster thing stuck above the bed so it was very clear what they'd got in when it went in indications etc and on the back of it there would be a flow algorithm of what to do if it was blocked so it's it's worth having a, a look at that and just following it through to try and make some sense of what could be a scary situation. And that's it for questions now. Um, are there any questions at all at the moment?